What's going on, everybody? We have one of the toughest men who has ever walked the planet joining us today. And I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. But first, I want to share a word from our sponsors. The Pressing Limits podcast is brought to you by ZionMissionaryChurch.net. And there you can watch and listen to messages. You can share your prayer requests, or you can even find out how to plan a visit. And also by the newly updated NeuroPowerSource.com. And these are resources for your mind, your body, and your spirit. I've put discount codes on there for all the recommended gear that I use, including all kinds of tools and resources to help you along your journey. But let's jump into it right now. Our guest today, Randy Couture. Randy is a high school wrestling state champion. He is a U.S. Army soldier, three-time NCAA All-American, international Greco-Roman competitor, a six-time UFC world champion, where Randy fought 16 title fights, and he is a Hall of Famer. As an actor, Randy's credits include the films The Expendables, The Expendables 2, opposite Sylvester Stallone and Bruce Willis, and The Expendable 3, Expendables 3. His television shows include CBS's The Unit, Spike's Lip Sync Battle, HBO's Ballers, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And I would have liked to have seen the next one. I didn't see it. Dancing with the Stars, Impractical <laughs> Jokers, and Hawaii Five-0. Now, Randy served six years in the U.S. Army, and he attained the rank of sergeant in the 101st Airborne. In 2009, he started his foundation, the Extreme Couture GI Foundation. The GI Foundation is dedicated to helping injured veterans of America's armed forces. He is also teamed with Jay Glazier of Fox Sports and Green Beret and NFL player Nate Boyer to create Merging Vets and Players, which is MVP, which is a program designed to challenge or to address the challenges that a lot of combat veterans and professional athletes face when they have to transition their service, their professional life, toward a new mission in civilian life. With all that being said, I've, I've said this many times, Randy has so many great accomplishments athletically, but he's even a greater human being. Uh, having the privilege of presenting with him at the Arnold Classic before, I can tell you that he is a first-class guy all the way. Welcome to the show, Randy Couture. Thank you very much. It's so great to have you today, and I'm excited for people to get to know your story a little bit. Um, you have had a tremendous athletic career going all the way back to high school. Can you kind of share with us your athletic journey to the UFC? I mean, did you ever imagine anything like that when you were a high school wrestler? Um, things have evolved yeah. so much. Can you share that with us? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it, it's not something I ever saw myself doing. I, I loved wrestling. I started wrestling when I was 10 years old in the state of Washington. Uh, was never in trouble, never gotten street fights. I mean, I think I was in two fights like that all through school. Um, so that was never a big part of my life. I think I got all that energy and, ang and angst out on the wrestling mat. Um, I, was, I wanted to be an Olympian. I mean, I, as a small kid, my favorite sport was skiing. I started skiing at five years old, and I wanted to be an Olympic skier. Somehow I made it my way onto a wrestling mat, and, and so that kind of filled that void, and I wanted to be an Olympian and pursued being a, an Olympic wrestler. Uh, life changed for me about 18 years old. I, I, I had a baby on the way. Uh, had to find a way to support a family, and so I, I joined the United States Army at 19. Um, my son was born just before I left for basic training. My daughter was actually born while I was stationed in Germany, and uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm a cat in some ways. I've lived these lives. I think I've lived about seven of my nine lives, and I've got two left, so uh, it, they almost feel like different lives in and of themselves. Uh, six years in the army, I made some amazing friends. Uh, I thought wrestling was over when I joined the service. I was in survival mode, trying to support a new family. And, uh, lo and behold, in the peak of the cold war, there was about 5 million soldiers stationed in central Europe. So they had huge sports programs and wrestling was one of those. I ended up winning a, a U.S. Army Europe championship, getting a chance to try out for the all army wrestling team. And I think it was during that 
that period of time that I developed the confidence in myself to, to believe I could compete at that level. Uh, I ended up getting a scholarship offer after the 88 Olympic trials where I was an alternate as a soldier uh, to go to college and, and wrestle in college. Oklahoma State was where I decided uh, to go, and I think it was those four years at Oklahoma State where I, I learned and believed I could win at that level. Ultimately, a, a few years later, and I graduated from college in 92, I uh, was coaching at Oregon State as an assistant wrestling coach, and I uh, was introduced to the sport of mixed martial arts via video, a VHS tape, and uh, immediately saw a guy I, I wrestled and trained with in, in college, Don Fry, mm. competing. So I was immediately drawn to what was going on in this cage and saw the application of years of wrestling training and experience in a sport where I got a chance to be a professional athlete in our society, which I think is a pretty big deal. Uh, fortunate enough to have some success there, ended up leaving my coaching job to pursue fighting full time and, and ended up fighting for about 14 years and, uh, retired from fighting in 2011. And here we are. I'm, I'm happily, uh, you know, engaged in several other businesses, my gyms and clothing line. And, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm really having a blast and been very passionate about acting and trying to get better and more acting jobs. So. Uh, it, it's been an, a crazy journey, not one I could ever anticipate. That's awesome. And, you know, I just kind of want to let people inside a little bit, if you can kind of tell them, because I don't think anybody really understands, unless somebody like you that's been in the octagon, what it takes to prepare for a fight. Um, can you share with people kind of like what training camp looks like and, you know, yeah. just kind of get into that a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think it, it, it may be a little bit different for, for everybody, but I've been involved in the sport in tw for 20 years and kind of been through not only my own camps, but seeing a lot, uh, how a lot of my friends and other competitors get prepared to walk out there and do battle as well. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a crazy thing to, to, you know, average training camp is about 12 weeks for most people. Uh, I found kind of that sweet spot for me was about 10 weeks. I did 12. It felt a little too long. I did six and eight week camps on occasion. 10 weeks seemed to be kind of the sweet spot for me. Um, it's a two a day training process for, for usually six days a week. You got to get some rest in there. The rest is almost as, as important as the hard work that you put in while you're in the gym and on the mat. Um, so, I generally would go to fight night, to print out a blank calendar. It's generally 12 weeks out. Print out that blank calendar, write in fight night. This is the night I'm going out to kick somebody's ass. Yeah. You know. Now I'm going to back up from there. There's weigh-ins. I got to make weight that day before. And I'm going to back up from there. Okay, now seven days out, that's going to be my last hard workout. Uh, my last intense hard workout. It gives me seven days to recover and get my legs back under me and get my body feeling full of energy and ready to go from the training process. And then each day from that last hard workout, I'm, I'm going to plan and write out a map. You wouldn't go from here to Dallas without looking at a map or, or consulting a map. This is exactly what I'm doing is I'm writing that map that's going to get me to that fight night. Um, what days are going to be my strength and conditioning days? What days are going to be my hard sparring days? What days are going to be on the ground in situations that I anticipate being in for this fight versus this opponent. It's problem solving at its finest. That guy standing across the cage from me poses a certain set of problems, and I got to figure out how to solve those in real time and in real world. I call it kinetic chess. It's an action that. reaction sport. Uh, you know, it's, it's kinetic chess. And sometimes you get it right and it feels great. And sometimes you get it wrong and, it, <laughs> and it's not so much fun. But you know what? Those losses. Uh, and those times you get it wrong are, are the most important times. I never watched the fights I won. Mm -hmm. I watched every single one of them that I lost over and over and tried to figure out what I could do better, where I could correct my mistakes, and how I could improve both as an athlete and a human from that adversity, from that experience. And you know, I have a 19 and 11 record as a, as a fighter. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh, you won six world titles. Yeah, that means I lost it at least five times. You know, it, it's not always about winning. I think real character uh, as an athlete is, is in how you respond to that adversity, how you respond 
to defeat? Do you sack up your bats and go home, or do you pick your stuff up, dust it off, and figure out how to move forward and do a better job next time? I think that's real character right there. That's why athletics is so important for our kids. Mm -hmm. It teaches us those real-life, real-world experiences and, and, and to face adversity and do it with sportsmanship and do it with that character that you know you can do better. Man, I love that, the whole responding. And that's the thing about you know the UFC or any mixed martial arts group there's so many different things that you're coming up against. You know, one opponent may have strengths as a striker. One guy may be great at ground attack, you know, and learning how to adapt to all those guys. I, I just think that a lot of times people don't understand the genius that you have to have as far as a, a combat athlete because you have to think on so many different levels and prepare for so many different things. And I just always respect you guys for that. And want to kind of move into this because I think this is a real interesting aspect. How important is mental toughness and emotional control when you're in the octagon? What are some of the thoughts that go through your mind during a takedown, during a strike, or when you're in the guard? Um, did you have any mental visualization techniques? Just kind of share the, the mental toughness aspect of what it's like to be in a cage. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very important thing, and I, I feel fortunate having wrestled for the national team for 16 years. I got exposed to a sports psychologist, you know, mm. and we call it mental skills, developing the mental skills to deal with the adversity of competition. Walking out into the center of that mat in front of thousands of people or those four steps up into that cage in front of 20,000 people, that's an adverse situation for just about anybody. Mm -hmm. So p finding a way to wrap your brain around that to unlock – that little, we all have that self dialogue. I call him my crazy roommate, <laughs> especially when the pressure gets turned on, says all kinds of stuff. So learning who's controlling who I control that voice, or I can step behind that voice and let him say whatever he wants to say. I don't have to react. I don't, I can watch it go on in front of me. I get to choose when I react or what I react to and fighting in a lot of ways is that same thing, but I have to get that voice under control and, and focus on what I train to do and go out there and stay calm stay relaxed, doesn't matter what the situation is. And, and as a fighter, you come up with those words that your cornerman knows. If you get hit or clipped and, and get a wobble or, or you're starting to get tired or you're not getting getting done what you know you're trained to do, having those phrases that, that center you again, that get you right back on task and right back into the fight, doing the things you're trained to do uh, is very important. And that's a mental skill. I think learning to frame things in a positive way. You know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, do you get nervous for your fights? I'm like, well, nervous. Why would I be nervous? You look at the word nervousness, and, and it implies something negative is going on. Something bad might happen. Even if I got knocked out, I, I'm going to be fine. I've been there. The people that really matter are still there for you. They're not going anywhere. And the fans are fleeting. You know, they're a fickle group. You're as, yes. only as good as, as your last win, as your last fight. So you can't hinge your performance or anything on that you have to be true to yourself and find a way to wrap your brain around going out there making friends with the worst case scenario and and being able to smile and let it out and, and do what you're trained to do those are all mental skills framing is a huge thing i'm never nervous i'm excited you think of the physical attributes you associate with being nervous sweaty palms i go to pee all the time you know that bowl of butterflies in your stomach well, what are the, the physical attributes you assign to being excited about something? A very, very similar physical experience, but you put one handle on that and it's negative. You put the other handle, I'm excited. I'm excited on fight night. I get to go out and show everybody what I've been working on, what I've been training to do, how I'm going to solve this problem. And, and if I got it right, it's going to be a really, really fun night. And if I got it wrong, then I realize I got to go back and analyze that and figure out what I did wrong and how I can do better. And, and it's, it's that simple, framing it in that way. I'm excited. I'm never nervous. Nothing negative or bad is going to happen. If the worst thing that ever happens to me is I lose a fight, I'm doing pretty damn good. So yeah. I think finding that right, that right visualization is a huge thing. I saw that fight a thousand times before I actually walked out that tunnel and walked up in that cage on fight night. I saw it in my brain. I saw him throw everything but the kitchen sink at me after every single practice and every night going through camp until I walked in there on, on fight night, I saw it. I saw it a thousand times. 
And the one common denominator in all of that is I saw my hand get raised at the end of that fight every single time I visualized it. And I physically prepared myself because if, if you will have a physical response to those pictures that you put in your head. You will, if you buy into that little voice and let him undermine your confidence on fight week, you'll be out doing sprints in the parking lot because he said, oh, man, what if I get tired? I should have done more sprints. Mm. No. Have confidence in your plan. Yep. Yep. You know you laid it out there. You know you did everything you know how to do right. Don't let that little voice talk you into doing things that you don't need to do. Step behind it. Let it say what it wants to say. Shut it up. Stop. And then you repeat the affirm affirmations, the affirmative things that you know you want to do on that fight night that you train to do. That's a mental skill. And the more that you do those things, the easier and more part of you those become. And I always felt like I had an advantage because most of the fighters I knew had not been exposed to that. They hadn't, and, and so it's something I felt like I got to pass on to my guys at, at Team Quest or Extreme Couture. The, 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 those were skills that I had learned and developed through years of wrestling at the Olympic level uh, that, that most of the fighters had not been exposed to. So, um, and I think it made a huge difference for me, certainly. And I think I saw that in some of them too. They started using those same types of skills and, and honing them and fitting them into themselves and using them and allowed them to fire on all cylinders on all cylinders on fight night. Yeah. And that's why I'm so excited about this podcast today, because that's pure gold for where people are today. You know, we, as a society, have to learn these mental skills. And there's so much that, you know, carries over from what's happening in the ring to what's happening in real life. I mean, you're going to get knocked down. How do you get back up? How do you, you know, one of the things I love about that whole aspect is you're locked in a cage. you got to face your fears. You know, you got to deal with it head on. There's nowhere to go. And so I think people that are listening today, you know, if you apply this, this works in every area of your life. You know, with what we're dealing with right now with COVID, whatever it may be, you know, if you can face your fears and begin to deal with it, silence the crazy roommate. I love that. That was like one of the best analogies I've ever heard for self-talk ever. I love that. That's going to, this is life-changing stuff, whether you're an athlete or, you know, you're just a, a mom or dad at home listening today. Um, thinking about the UFC, did you have a favorite fight or opponent or story from your time there? Well, I mean, I, I had a lot of, uh, I mean, each and every fight was a great fight and, yeah. and a fun experience. You know, even in, in the 11 losses, like I said, I mean, those, they were pivotal. They were, they were important in my journey to keep me on track and keep me progressing. Um, I think my favorite fight uh, of all of them was, was the Tim Sylvia fight. You know, I'd been retired for 13 months, settling a divorce and going through a rough, rough period, stepped away from the sport. Uh, the dust settled. I started to feel like myself again uh, and, and was lucky enough to get a chance to, to compete against Tim Sylvia, who's a friend, somebody you know, I considered a friend. And I knew that was going to be a, a struggle for him to kind of check that stuff to the side and go out and do what we needed to do for, for our competition. Um, but uh, that crowd that night in, in Ohio, 20, 21 or 22,000 people, and, and the way that fight went down, I think I was 44 at the time. Most people thought I was insane to even come back and try and fight again, especially against a guy that's six foot eight and, and had literally been owning the heavyweight division for about three years. So um, that crowd was amazing. That last 10 second countdown, can, I can hear that ringing in my ears to this day still. It was an amazing night and a fun fight. Um, Close, probably the closest I ever came to that one punch knockout in the first 20, 25 seconds of that fight. I hit him with an overhand right, mm -hmm. which was my, I had practiced and visualized that first contact uh, for the entire camp. And then to have it go off and, and work the way it worked, I think I was as stunned as everybody in the, in the arena when Tim fell down. So uh, uh, it was a crazy night. But uh, yeah, it was definitely, my, I think, my all time favorite. Awesome. You know, there are a lot of people that might not know this. How did you get the moniker, the natural? I mean, they're like Randy, the natural couture. How did you get that moniker? <laughs> well, 
My uh, second UFC, second show, is my third fight because I fought twice in the tournament in my very first UFC, UFC 13. My second show, they wanted me to fight Vitor Belfort in a super fight. And at that time, Vitor was called the Phenom. He had literally torn through everybody in under a minute, minute and a half. I think he had four fights at that time with an aggregate time of about three minutes Hmm. in all four of those fights. I mean, he was literally just blowing through everybody. And that's who they wanted me to fight next. So I went out and got a boxing coach because he was doing it with his hands mostly and, and trained hard to learn some boxing to go with my wrestling background. And I believed if I could get my hands on Vitor uh, and make him wrestle me, uh, I had a, a good chance of wearing him out and, and winning. Uh, so that was our game plan. I think most people, you know, I was 37, you know, 35 years old uh, at that time which by most people's estimation in a combative sport was over the hill already. And here's this kid who was 20, 21, I think, uh, tearing everybody up. Everybody thought I was going to get my butt kicked, and, uh, and it didn't go that way. It, it, you know, and, and in a lot of ways, that fight set the tone for my entire career because I found myself in that same circumstance uh, a few times. Uh, but I believed in, and had you know, prepared mentally and physically to go and solve that problem, and, and it worked out. But uh, that, you know, that was one of those situations. That's awesome. Now, how has the UFC evolved since you first began as a fighter? I know you're talking about Don Fry. I mean, there were some wars probably you saw on video. It was a different thing back then, how it's really evolved. How would you say it's evolved over your time there? Well, I mean, you you talk about that first fight, UFC 13. We weighed in in the lobby at the Holiday Inn in Augusta, Georgia. And that was the first time I saw any of the opponents that I was going to fight in that tournament. Mm. I didn't have video on them. I didn't know who they were. Uh, You know, we fought in a small civic center there. It was maybe 2,000 people. They gave away most of the tickets to get butts in the seats for the pay-per-view. That's crazy. And there were, more, there were more fights in the stands that night <laughs> than there were in the cage. And there was two full tournaments going on in the cage. So, I mean, it was a different crowd and a different mentality. People were there to see a fight. They didn't really know who the fighters were for the most part. Um, you know, like, now look at it. They're cordoning off half of the arena just to hold the weigh-ins. Yep. And they're broadcast on ESPN, which is probably one of the biggest sports broadcasts broadcasts in 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 the world um on the ticker you know you get five six thousand people showing up just for the weigh-ins yeah um i you know you get to go back and look at footage I, you know most of my opponents i could find seven eight nine a dozen fights that i could watch the video and study their tactics and their technique and see their progression figure out where they've won figure out where they've lost where they like to be where they don't seem to like like to be, all that you know was kind of how the sport grew, and and became the hybrid combative sport that it is today. And I think it's the combative sport for this generation for sure. I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And um, let's let's shift gears just a little bit because you are such a multifaceted guy. You know, you're a businessman, you're an actor. I mean, you really do it all. Uh, how did you get your start in acting? I was, uh, it's one of those things, one of those doors that just opened back in 98, 99, they were looking for authentic cage fighters for a scene in a movie called Cradle to the Grave with Jet Li and DMX. They called the UFC, the UFC called me, Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz and asked if we were interested in being in this movie, in this scene. All three of us said yes. Um, they actually had Chuck and Tito fighting each other in that, in that scene and then I was supposed to do a fight with Jet Li. I had one line in the movie, uh, but it was a it was like going to Oz and getting a chance to pull back the curtain and see the guy that was making all the smoke and fire in Oz. And and it was a really really interesting, unique experience. We spent seven days filming that one five minute scene for that movie. It was a very complicated big fight scene and and kind of an underground fight show. Um, so it was a kind of an eye opener and immediately was intrigued by this whole process. I spent my life as an athlete, boxing up my emotions, yep. pushing them to the side and staying focused, <laughs> laser focused on the problem at hand, which was that guy standing on the field or, or in the cage with me or on the mat with me. So mm-hmm. this whole let your emotions out thing was a, a really, really strange uh, exercise that I uh, was not used to and had to kind of figure out, had to kind of 
sort out how to how am I going to tell the truth here? Because if you're trying to act and portray something, it's mm -hmm. never going to sell. Nobody's yeah. going to buy it. You've got to tap into your own stream of experience. Find a way to relate to that character. No matter what he says or does, you have to relate to him and find a way to tell the truth. That's what acting is all about. And a director is going to create an environment that's make-believe, but it's so believable that you can find that character in there. I mean, that's this whole game. That's what acting is. It's, it's very strange. Not something I ever did. I think I was in the sixth grade play. Uh, I played Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol in the sixth grade. That was it for Holy me. Holy so cow. God bless everyone. <laughs> Now I, you know, now I've done I think 42 feature films and a plethora of TV shows uh, over the last 20 years. It's been this crazy thing, and obviously fighting always took first first position. I would juggle a, you know, juggle the balls and, and get an acting job in between fights or here and there. But since retiring in 2011 from fighting, I can focus on acting 100. percent All the other businesses and stuff are up and running and doing what they should do, and don't take a whole lot of my time. Uh, for the most part, uh, but so I can focus solely on acting, getting better, act, better acting jobs and, and becoming a better actor. Yeah. And it's so interesting, you know, think about your journey. When you said that, do you ever just sit back and think, oh my goodness, where I came from, from Tiny Tim to movie star? <laughs> do you ever think about that? You know, just say, wow, you know, what a journey. Yeah. You no, know, I, I pinch myself all the time for a whole bunch. I mean, this is, this journey has been so crazy. And like I said, I, I feel like I'm a cat. I've lived seven of my nine lives. I got two lives left, uh, but it's you know it's it's been crazy to come on set that first night in in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, with with all the expendables to have all those guys come together in that first big scene. We're standing around a well, getting ready to infiltrate a castle, and, and it's Statham and Stallone and Jet Li and Dolph Lundgren and Terry Crews and myself and. I think everybody was buzzing. It was like this crazy group of guys that get to come together for this film. It was a, definitely a pinch me moment. And I've had many of those in, in my career and on this journey. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. What was it like to be on the set of The Expendables, knowing that you've got like all the action guys of all time together? And I, I would say this, all these alpha males what was that like chemistry wise? Because, you know, you guys are all top dogs. You know what I'm saying? What was yeah, that like? you think, you, you know, everybody assumes there'd be a bunch of posturing and a bunch of BS, but there was absolutely none. Uh, I think we were all excited to be part of this huge ensemble of guys. And, and to a man, I, I, you know, we were shooting Expendables 2 in Bulgaria and we're outside of the, an airport called, in Plovdiv, this little town. And we literally trashed this airport. Uh, oh, man. You know, this was Van Damme was the bad guy. We're, it's cold, so we're all in these tents, and we're all getting tacked up, putting on our gear, getting all our stuff lined up to go out and shoot a scene where all of us, I think there was, gosh, I think there was 10 of us that were all going to be shooting as Jean-Claude Van Damme, <laughs> who was trying to escape on a four-wheeler. It was crazy. And I'm sitting in a tent getting tacked up with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Chuck Norris, Bruce Willis. I mean, we're all looking at each other like, can, can you believe this? This is insane. And I was getting the same vibe from them. And they've been in this business for, you know, 30 plus years, many of them. So I think we all had the same kind of feeling. It's like, man, this is really cool and, and fun to be a part of. And honestly, it felt a lot like being a part of my old high school team. Hmm. We're in the locker room telling jokes and cracking up and, and getting ready to go out for the big game. It, it, it kind of felt like that when most of the time. Everybody's cracking jokes. They all have great personalities. And we were all really excited to be there. So... Uh, there was no posturing. There was no, I think Stallone set the tempo and the pace for that entire thing. He's the only guy that could have pulled that off. Yeah. It's just incredible stuff. I mean, if you're an action guy, I mean, you just can't beat those movies. Um, do you have a favorite experience because you've, you've kind of done it all from movies to television. Do you have kind of a favorite special experience from your acting career? Um, you know, we were, we were, we were sitting, we had just gotten to Bulgaria to shoot Expendables 3. <clears throat> the, the opening weeks and scenes for that film were in uh, Varna, which is on the Black Sea. It's a small town on the Black Sea uh, on the coast of, of Bulgaria. So we're, we roll in there. 
our first day of shooting all the, you know, so we got the, we got the band back together, you know, it's yeah. kind of that feeling. And, and, uh, second unit had been doing a bunch of stuff, uh, for that week going in, but this was a really our first scene with the real characters, not stunt doubles or anything else coming together. And we're going to film this scene while we're being chased down this alleyway. That's, you know, it's a port on the black sea, but in the film it's Somalia. Mm. And we're being chased by some gun runners and they're shooting at us with this, you know, 50 cal machine gun. And we're in a flatbed truck trying to get away and get to our boats to escape. This was the first scene. So they stunt guys show us exactly what we're going to do, where our positions are, what's going to happen. We're all getting our gear on, standing there on the, on the, on the edge of the dock. And Jason's like, wow, man, I got to drive that, that truck. I've never driven a truck like that. So can we back it up back down the alley? And I want to drive it down just to make sure how it feels and how it drives. So we're all standing there getting dressed and they back it up and Jason gets in the truck and he comes driving down just like the stunt guys did, you know, wide open, exposed to turn and come to a screeching halt so we can all pile off. Well, he makes the turn and the brakes go out in this truck. Oh my goodness. He literally <laughs> runs over two cameramen with an $80,000 camera on the edge of the dock and goes oh. over the edge of the dock 18 foot drop into the water in this truck and we're all just standing there watching this happen Sly pulls out his iPhone and starts recording on his iPhone he's like oh can you, I can't can you believe that it, you know we're just we're like in disbelief <laughs> everybody makes a dive for for the edge of the dock that we had safety divers there because we're operating near and close to water sure. immediately the two cameramen pop up Jason pops up the truck and the camera are gone, uh, and we're all just, we couldn't believe what just happened. And, uh, you know, we're, we're laughing. Jason's fine. He has a bump on his head, and he's soaking wet, so now he has to get a new wardrobe. Uh, the two camera guys were fine, but an $80,000 red at the bottom of the bay <laughs> in the Black <laughs> Sea. So uh, uh, pretty crazy, pretty ridiculous. You know, Terry was one of the first guys to get wrapped uh, early in that film, you know, he gets shot by Mel Gibson's character and all this stuff. But uh, he goes on to tell that story on the Tonight Show when he got back to the states oh, uh, and kind of confirmed everything that happened. Thankfully, nobody was injured. Yeah, uh, I'm sure the camera was insured. They got another truck just exactly like it, but it had brakes this time. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> you know, everything turned out just fine. But it was a pretty crazy moment um, for sure. Wow, that is an insane story. And speaking of insane, I have to ask this because your toughness is legendary. And when I say that Randy is tough, I think one experience kind of sums it up. My understanding is this. Now, I have to have you confirm this, is that when you had your heart attack in the gym, <laughs> you actually finished your workout before you checked yourself into the hospital. Um, and I, I heard somebody say that you actually tried to roll it out with a foam roller, you know, just kind of like, you know, tough it out. Is that true? true? Yeah. No, no one ever said I was the smartest guy in the room, but, uh, yeah, I was working out at unbreakable in LA. That's, that's Jay Glazer's gym there. And, and where we started the MVP program, merging vets and players that you talked mm -hmm. about. And, you know, Jay and, and Nate were the founding members. I, I started the chapter here in Vegas out of my gym at extreme couture, uh, and I'm on the board for that, but uh, I was I was training there like I do most of the times I'm in L.A. Uh, I was actually Monday and Tuesday was on a horse shooting a western. Had two days off. I wasn't supposed to be back to work till Friday, so Wednesday I rolled into the gym, got a workout in, get through most of the way through the workout, and I feel like crap. I'm like, man, it's only been two days. I, I just trained, you know, Saturday. Can't be, you know, I, it was weird. I couldn't figure it out sweating my butt off and just feeling, I thought, man, I popped a rib. I had this ache that kind of wrapped around my chest and through fighting and, and wrestling for years, I popped my rib several times. Mm -hmm. This was a little duller, wasn't quite as intense as that, but it was that kind of an ache that just wrapped around my body to my back. And so I'm finishing the workout. I'm like, man, I just feel like crap. I can't figure it out. So I got the foam roller and I'm like, I must've popped a rib. So I'm trying to roll, you know, roll my back out, put, see if my ribs mm -hmm. pop nothing doesn't really help i drink a recovery drink and immediately run straight to the trash can to, to puke mm. 
I, that was a red flag for me. I've never been an, a, a puker ever. I've never exerted myself in all the training that I've done. I've never been that guy. So I was like, what the hell? Am I coming down with the flu? What's going on? So I put dry clothes on. I drive home. It still won't go away. Uh, my, my girlfriend, Mindy, is with me, and, and she's you know tinkering around in the garage starting her car. I go up to lay down. I'm like, man, I must have just exerted myself too much or something. And uh, it just won't go away. She comes back up from the from the garage, and I'm like, babe, something's wrong. It just doesn't feel right. Something is not right. Uh, I never puke. I puked. I just this ache won't go away. Let's walk over to to the Cedar Sinai Hospital, which the emergency room is three blocks from from my condo in L.A. So we walk over there, and I roll in. I said, hey, I'm having a weird chest pain. I don't know if I popped a rib or what, but. And he said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll get you right in. So about 10 minutes later, they bring me in, hook me up to the EKG. Oh, boy. All hell breaks loose. Like, oh, my God, you're having a full-blown heart attack. They start ripping my clothes off, get me on a gurney, running me upstairs to the cath lab to, to go in and put a catheter in, and, you know, put, put a, a stint in. And, and clear, I had a big clot in my Widowmaker, my diagonal artery in my heart. And uh, so they sucked the clot out, put a stent in. So I went from riding a horse on Tuesday to being in a cardiac ICU on Wednesday night. I'm like, what the hell just happened? It was just crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I walked in. I mean, let's be honest. It would have taken longer for an ambulance or a car to come pick yep. me up than it would have been to walk that three, week, that three blocks. Um, well, we're glad that you walked in, bro. I mean, not, not when. <laughs> it worked when... out. I'm, you know, I'm just glad it happened where and when it happened. I mean. There was a month before we were camping and hiking up Yosemite. If I had, I was really dehydrated, hiking and sweating that much. And if that happened there, yep. I would have been done. Man. I would have been toast. Would have never worked out. So, you know, things happen the way they're supposed to happen sometimes. Now, when she found out how serious it was, did Mindy give you the business a little <laughs> bit? <Did> she? <laughs> no, she, I think she was in shock too. I mean, she okay. called me to the hospital, and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose, and she's literally standing outside of, of an operating room as I'm being wheeled in, you know, and my clothes are being ripped off and her eyes were huge. She was like, they thought she, they, they, she thought they were ripping my chest open. Like, oh my goodness. My she didn't know what, you know, and, and I wasn't sure what the hell was going on either, to be honest. So it was definitely a, a kind of a freaky moment. Yeah. It just speaks of, of your toughness and your pain tolerance. Like you're, you're superhuman for sure. Um, now I, I think it is so admirable that you are giving back to help veterans. Uh, this is such a powerful thing because I think this is a huge lesson for people to learn that, you know, success, when you're successful, you gotta learn to give back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Extreme Couture GI Foundation and what that's all yeah. about? Um, in, in 96, actually ni 2006, sorry. In, in 2006, I got to go to Iraq. Me and Rich Franklin went to Iraq for 12 days uh, we flew in through Kuwait, flew into Baghdad, flew to, to five different bases, uh, FOBs, forward operating base in that country and, and hung out with a bunch of our soldiers on the front line fighting the, the Iraqi war. Um, it was a really interesting trip. I was a soldier. I spent six years in the army. I did all that training. I signed up for that. I took that oath. Never had to put my butt on the line. And obviously, since 9-11, we've had a lot of guys have to put their butt on the line. So uh, going over there and seeing the living conditions, seeing the, how, what things were going on, you know, were going on in, in the theater of operation was, was an eye-opener. The next year, uh, I, I went to uh, Walter Reed in D.C. We did a barbecue at the Fisher House. Me, Don Fry, uh, uh, Ken Shamrock. One of my buddies, Mike Davis, who was a motorcycle builder, put on this barbecue for all the family and service members that were in the Fisher House, uh, which is their Ronald McDonald House. It's for mm -hmm. wounded guys, their families stay in the Fisher House while they're going through the process in the hospital. We got to walk the wards and meet, meet a bunch of families and a bunch of guys fresh off the battlefield, going, getting fitted for prosthetics, learning to, to walk again, going through multiple, sometimes upwards of 20 surgeries to get themselves right. To then what? Be transitioned back to the civilian world. And almost to a man, every one of them was like, man, I can't wait to get my leg and get back up and going. My guys are still over there. These guys, every single one of them couldn't get, couldn't wait to get back mm. to their unit, 
to their brothers, to the guys that were still there fighting. And you're thinking, dude, haven't you sacrificed enough already for crying out loud? So it was really, really interesting. And it was through that experience and hearing some of the horror stories, of the financial woes of these family members and these guys that are in that limbo, in that, that transition after being wounded, that, that was the impetus for me starting the Extreme Couture GI Foundation. We're very small. It's my gym staff my friends and my family that helped me run this foundation. We have no real overhead. They all work for me already at the gym. So uh, every single dime we raise goes into the hands of a family and a soldier that's been wounded and help take off that financial pressure for, on them while they're in that transition state. And then, you know, that leads us obviously to MVP. Um, that's in players.org is, is the name of that foundation and where you can find it if you want to donate or get involved Nate Boyer and, and Glazer founded that. Uh, I'm you know, close to both of those guys and, and part of the staff at, at Unbreakable where, where was the epicenter. Watched the magic literally unfold uh, with this peer-on-peer -peer counseling and getting these guys working out again, getting them connected with, with other veterans and other ball players that, that walked away from their identity in a lot of ways. So that, um, I said, I got tired of hearing them bitch basically about, oh, we need another chapter. So I'm like, guys, I own a gym. What the, you know, so I basically took the bull by the horns. We started it here uh, on the, after the two years that it had been running in LA, started it here in Vegas. And now we're in five cities across the country and we have a new uh, national director. We have an executive director. We kind of, we jumped right in and got the cart before the horse in a lot of ways, but now we've kind of up and running. We're in five cities nationwide. Our goal is to be in 10 cities by the end of this year. We're, we're looking at Dallas right now, um, which will be which will be really cool. Um, and it's basically a safe place where these guys can train, sweating and, and, and all that together breaks down barriers. We spend 30, 45 minutes sweating. And then we spend another hour sitting on the mats, talking. We call a huddle, uh, creating a place where they can be vulnerable. They can let those demons out of the bag and let them into the light of day with guys that all speak the same language and are struggling with the same things. And there's, it's been amazingly powerful in the four years we've been running this program. Uh, to date, we have not had a single MVP member take his own life. And so we're excited about that stat and we want to continue that train, that trend and turn that 22 that we lose a day back i mean it's never going to be zero that's i think unrealistic but it certainly doesn't need to be up at 22 or sounds like adjusted numbers now or more like 25 a day so i mean that's a horrible thing um so th those are the two ones i'm really involved with and happy to be giving back to service members that took that oath just like i did when i was 19 years old and and have actually had to go out and execute that training and do those things that we asked them to do as a nation so proud to be part of the both of those and help those guys that, that are doing those things that a lot of people wouldn't or couldn't do yeah it's just so important to honor those guys and what you're doing you know i just can't you know give you enough props for that i mean it just is such a worthy cause and again you know it's all about patriotism too and, and reminding the sacrifice the things that we get to do somebody paid the price for it and i just appreciate you doing that so much a um, couple more quick questions. Do you have any advice for young athletes that are listening today? Like we've got some athletes that are just getting started in their career, some high school students, colleges, these young athletes, what advice would you give them, you know, as they're you know, kind of beginning their journey? I think the most important things they can focus on is, first of all, pursuing their passion. If this is their passion, if this is who they want to be and what they want to do, pursue that with everything that they have. Be a student of the game. It's not enough just to be talented. Some people are born more talented than others. Uh, the guy that is the total package is the guy that has some of that talent but also has the diligence and the work ethic that goes with it. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to rise to, to the level where everybody's talented. Mm -hmm. How many guys actually make the NFL? How many guys actually make Major League Baseball or NBA or MMA that the UFC or Bellator or PFL level, a very, very small percentage of the population make it to that level. You're dealing with a lot of very talented individuals. How are you going to distinguish yourself from all those other people? And it starts right here. And that thing that's beaten behind your chest, your heart and your diligence 
are the two things that, that are going to allow you to distinguish yourself from every other talented guy that wants to be the state champ, wants to be in the NFL or at that professional level. There are 50 state champions in, in every weight class in wrestling. There's 50 guys out there that want that same thing that you want. You tell me how you're going to distinguish yourself and, and put yourself above those guys and beat those guys when it really counts. It's by being a student of the game, having that diligence, and doing the work. The talent is only going to take you so far. Yeah, I love that. That's just that's gold. You know, for people that are listening today, you apply that stuff. It, it's going to make you a success in whatever you do. Well, what's what's next for Randy Couture? What's next on the plate? I mean, you talk about these nine lives. I mean, you, you've you've done it all. Yeah. But I think we haven't seen it all. I mean, you're always you know doing something new. You're always on the edge. You have anything new? Well, I, I'm, you know, really focused for the, for the last nine years uh, on on acting, on getting better acting jobs and upping my game there, and, and getting, you know, get, building that that part of, you know, I, I can no longer walk those four steps up in the cage and and pursue that passion. And I walked away from wrestling in 2000 after the 2000 trials. Uh, you know, I think physically you have to know your limitations and know the right time to walk away. And and I think I did that. And I'm proud of that. I'm happy I, I left when I left on, the, on my own terms. I didn't have some doctor promoter telling me I shouldn't do it anymore. So that allows me to focus on the other businesses that I have that are, that are important for my family, for my kids, and my legacy moving forward. But my passion and the thing I'm enjoying is, is finding new acting jobs and getting involved in acting, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. I'm, I'm interested in directing and telling stories and the stories I want to see on film uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in learning that process. Obviously, there's a whole business side to filmmaking, too. How do you sell a film? Where domestically, internationally, and there's all this other stuff that goes on behind the camera that I'm trying to learn about and, and get involved in now. Um, we had a film in pre-production that Mindy, Mindy wrote a script that I fell in love with a couple years ago and wanted to see you know, come, come to fruition, get, get made. And we were really close. We were in pre-production supposed to start shooting that here in Vegas on May 1st and then COVID broke out. So mm -hmm. everything got shut down, but we're ready to roll as soon as things start opening up. And it looks like the 15th of May here in Las Vegas, things are going to start, you know, phase one limited openings. And mm -hmm. the gym is, is part of that. Obviously we can't just get right back into grappling because of the close nature of, of our sport, but the striking, the, the conditioning classes, there are a lot of other classes that we offer that our members will be able to take advantage of in a, in a limited opening coming soon. Uh, we're going to get right back to getting Dark Angels back up and running and filmed here. I just got a script for Expendables 4. They're saying sometime in the uh, fall yeah. we're to start back. Uh, so obviously excited about that. Read the script. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's right in line with everything you would expect from an Expendables who they're adding, I couldn't tell you, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure there'll be some new additions to the cast uh, that, that will make it a lot of fun for everybody. Um, those are the things I'm focused on right now. I'm in the process of uh, transitioning Extreme Couture MMA to to my son, Ryan. Uh, I think I'm, I'm in a position where I want to focus on all this other stuff. My son's been fighting for you know 12 years uh, at, at a very high level professionally, and, and I think he's looking to focus on starting in his family and getting things rolling there on that side of his life and kind of wants to focus on the gym and the gym business. Uh, so I'm, I want to hand that over to him and let him kind of run with that. And, and I'm going to stay focused on the other, other businesses and, and this acting thing that started about 20 years for me. So, well, what's cool is your moniker continues in acting. You're natural, you know, it just, <laughs> People connect with you, and I think it's like you said, you know, the way that you're able to get into character, like you become that person. You believe it when you're doing it. People connect with you. Can't wait to see your new projects. You know, uh, best of success to this new project that you and Mindy are working on, this new movie. And um, as a closing question, just how can people find out more about you, and is there anything else that you want to share today? Uh, I, I think we covered covered the gambit. <laughs> Obviously, I'm on all the social media platforms. Uh, Randy underscore Couture on Twitter. Uh, Randy the Natural Couture is the fan page on Facebook. Uh, XC Natch on Instagram. Believe it or not, there's another Randy Couture out there that already had that Instagram handle. So it wasn't Whoa. just somebody squatting okay. on my name. As, as some people tend to do, but uh, so I had you know extreme couture and and the natural became XC Natch on Instagram. 
Uh, I actually like that 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 platform, the pictures and the, and a lot of things. You get to kind of get a snapshot of what people are doing in their lives. So that's a fun one for me. Uh, I'm not quite as savvy at the the tech stuff, so I've learned more from my smartphone than I think than my smartphone has taught me. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you for just investing in everybody today, not only with the stories, but with your wisdom. I feel like the people listen today, they came away and they're going to become better people because they have heard your story. So thank you again. So we want to thank our guest one last time, Randy Couture. We want to thank our sponsors, ZionMissionaryChurch.net, NeuropowerSource.com, our podcast producer, Drew Kiespert, film director, JoLynn Thomas, and be sure to rate us and subscribe to the Pressing Limits podcast. For more ways to watch and listen to this podcast, check out the Pressing Limits podcast website.